Hey, John, good to see you. Where does this podcast find you today? Today, I am in Palm Desert, California. This is my West Coast hideaway. I live in New York City with my beloved. But when I'm on the West Coast, I stay with my pop. He lives out here in a Sun City complex. He's 91 years old. And um, I've been kind of helping him out over the last few years. He really appreciates the company, you know, just helping out with household chores, cooking, cleaning, that kind of stuff. Very nice. What I wanted to talk to you about, John, is community, essentially. You're involved with the Grammys, which was, when was that, like two weeks ago, three weeks ago? One of the most extraordinary, uplifting award shows I've ever seen. And, you know, there's been some train wrecks that you weren't part of, but were quite memorable for people. <laughs> you know, Mr. Mr. Kanye, and on and on and on. There's been some mess. I understand that the ratings on that show, that was the most highly rated show since the pandemic. And everybody universally loved it. I did. I thought it was just on and on. Joni, Tracy Chapman. I mean, it was just like an amazing, amazing thing. So I wanted to speak to you a little bit about the Recording Academy, which is a community. And then also there were two other communities. There's the community that was in that room. And then there was the, I'm going to guess like 100 million, something like that, people, community, and the way that this show brought everybody together. But let's, let's just start with what is, the, um, what is the Recording Academy? I didn't really know. Maybe explain to people what that is. Not a lot of people know that there is a nonprofit behind the Grammys. It's called the Recording Academy. It's been around for 66 years now. And it was really organized as an association of professional music makers, um, whether you're a recording artist, whether you're a songwriter, whether you're an engineer. We now have lots of uh, record label people in the mix. We have attorneys, we have agents, managers. We also have a whole wing, which is for college students. It's called Grammy U. And it's about, it fluctuates over time, but it's between 22, 23,000 members. And we exist to serve and protect music makers. People think because we have the Grammy Award show that our job is to celebrate the best in music each year. And that is a key part of what we do. That's what we're famous for. But the other 364 days a year, we are in Washington, D.C., advocating for creator rights. We are in schools with programs like Grammy in Schools through our Grammy Museum affiliate, which is really about helping to educate younger people about careers in music. We also have a kind of health and human services operation called Music Cares, which is not just about addiction support, but, but really for people in any kind of uh, crisis, economic crisis or otherwise, how do we help lift them up? So it's very much a purpose-driven organization. I think sometimes it gets lost when you have a big, fabulous, you know, glitzy show. And we're all very grateful to have a big glitzy show that people care about. But we also want people to understand that we exist for a reason. And that is to help music, mm. music people. A purpose-driven community. Let's go to the big glitzy show. Because <laughs> I thought it was extraordinary. And I know that, you know, you were involved. You've been working on that it's a long time to, like, organize something like this. I'm curious about how do they go about this idea of creating this community in the room, which I thought was just so pot. I mean, it was just, it didn't feel like a competition. You know, some of those ones are like competitions. And this was so clearly just a celebration of the music and musicians and the art form and everybody supporting everybody. Like, is that designed? <laughs> it was like fantastic. Yeah, thank you. I mean, there are some really brilliant creative people who put all of that together. And, you know, if you go back for many years, the show was produced by a legendary guy named Ken Ehrlich. And they used to have what they called Grammy moments. And Grammy moments were essentially a kind of legacy artist working with an up and coming artist and doing a really beautiful duet or collaboration on stage. Um, you know, there's examples like Elton John duetting with Eminem. And obviously this is what, what Ageist um, is all about. But it's this idea that through sort of cross-generational, cross-pollination, mm. you really generate something unique. There's a kind of alchemy that comes out of that that's really, really unique. This year, and for the last few years, we've had a different 
a new production team um, led by Ben Winston. And um, that team, uh, we've done some of those Grammy moments, but we've done them in different ways. And I think this year, you could really sort of feel it was it was very clear. It was sort of unmistakable when a Luke Combs comes out with Tracy Chapman. And there was this this kind of moment that took your breath away in, in the room. And I think on, on television, when the lights came up and it was revealed who she was, who it was that was strumming the guitar, because that was all a mystery. We weren't allowed to talk about that beforehand. Um, and we haven't seen her in a long time. And we all you know, grew up with that song and love that song. And then when they would show Luke, who's a much younger person, and the clear adoration, right? The clear respect that he has for her artistry um, and for that moment. I mean, it was, it was really emotional. It was very powerful. Um, and there were a couple of those at this Grammys that I think really made it distinct. Um, you know, music in general um, creates a sense of, of tribe, right? If you love a certain type of music, you are part of a tribe. And we tap into a lot of those emotions with a show like the Grammys. Um, and I think it's one of the things that makes the Grammys different from some of the other award shows you're talking about, right? The slap on the Oscars or the Golden Globes, you know, where there's been some, some drama, right? Um, generally, I don't think people feel quite as tribal about film, right? You have people that love the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You have people that love... Bertolucci, right, in art films. Um, but you're trying to celebrate all of that in a single ceremony. There's something about music and the way that music makes us feel that whether it is a classical artist, a jazz artist, a country artist, a hip hop artist, an EDM artist, a rock artist, we're all in this music tribe. And it just really generates an incredible feeling of belonging. That Tracy Chapman thing, I've heard that song a thousand times. And I'd never heard that song until they totally. did. It. And then I heard it. I was like, I was just floored that that's what that song is about. Like, oh, I mean, I I bought that record when it came out. I didn't. I don't know what I was thinking. And the you know Celine Dion, who's has a lot of health problems and was out there with with Taylor and, and Joni. The intergenerational thing is something, as you said, in music that you don't get in a lot of places. And I, I think that that's wonderful. And, and just going back to the Recording Academy and our smaller community of 20 odd thousand, there's a lot of that sort of intergenerational um, love that happens within our smaller community. It's fascinating how you can go to a chapter meeting in San Francisco or in Memphis, any of our cities. We have 12 chapters around the country. And you'll see, you know, the 62-year-old blues musician chatting with the 22-year-old hip-hop artist. And they share yeah. a language, um, and it is the language of emotion. I mean, it's, it's art, right? It's, um, and art obviously binds people together. But we're actually, I mean, one of the, the main things that my team does in, in the marketing side of the Recording Academy is finding younger generations who are interested in our brand and in participating in our recording academy, meaning join the academy, become a voting member. Over the years, you know, people will complain about, oh, how come this person didn't win that award or this person wasn't nominated for that award? That is a voting question. And the only way that you improve voting is by improving voters. <laughs> so we've really spent a lot of time over the last four years, making sure that um, the ranks of our voters and of the Recording Academy are more diverse, um, that, that represent communities that haven't always had a voice within the Recording Academy. And part of that is all, also about demographics and ages. So um, one of the knocks on our group has been, oh, it's, you know, older white guys. Okay, great. We're going to bring in people who better reflect where music is today um, and make sure that they're um, that they are submitting work for consideration, that they are voting, that they are nominating. I think that's why you've seen the award change. Um, and it's definitely why you've seen renewed interest in 
the show and from, from our angle, sort of the social media, the influencers that are interested in working with us. Um, and that's all about bringing generations together. Let's go to community large. So that show that where there was, I don't know how many people in the room, thousand, a couple thousand, I guess, hundreds, 12,000 yeah. 12, in the room. Okay. Broadcast audience, hundreds of millions, I'm guessing, because it went out globally. And so <laughs> I wish. Well, well, globally, well, yeah. we'll say a lot of people. <laughs> so that ripple effect of being able to bring people together digitally. What, what are your thoughts on that? You know, one of the things about the mobile phone era, the social media era, is that we've really become detached from one another. I know you write about this and talk about this a lot. There's something very isolating, right? We've seen it now for the last 15 or so years. Um, and it's showing up in a bunch of different metrics. Um, and it, it is a global phenomenon, whether it's the rise of nationalism, whether it's the rise of you know, death by despair, um, that sort of thing. We've become quite isolated and the algorithms just reinforce what the algorithms know will get a sort of response from us, right? generally a kind of aggravated or agitated response. Um, so I think when there's a moment on television that is literally counter-programming to that, and that is about unifying people, that is about bringing people together, um, you know, we, we gravitate toward that. The, the, the number that really got crazy the week after our show is the Super Bowl. You know, and I think they did have over 120. I, the number, I, the stat I heard was, it was the largest TV audience for the Super Bowl since the moon landing right in 1969. Um, why? Why is that? It's because as a, frankly, as a civilization at this point, we lack those moments when we can all be together and, and gather and, and share, you know, a moment. So music does that. The Grammys does that. We have a huge audience in terms of people that watch. We have a thing called Premiere Ceremony, which is where the other 80 awards are given out. We stream that live on our website. We have a product called Grammy Live, which is sort of a best of the premiere and the red carpet. We package that up and we distribute that through a bunch of digital channels, including social media channels. Um, so the overall influence of, of the Grammys is well beyond the 17 million people who are watching CBS, you know, on Sunday night, Fed Four. And then, yes, when you start to talk about globally, um, it, it, really, it really fans out. And again, you know, it's interesting in the digital data, we see huge audiences in places like Nigeria. <laughs> We see huge audiences in Latin America, in Mexico, and it's because, you know, it's been said before, but music is a universal language. It's really powerful, actually, to work in that environment and to be a part of that. It's, uh, it's wonderful, you know, to, to have a job where you're involved in something that touches people's hearts. It's really incredibly rewarding. I think that there's this sort of shared ephemeral moment. Friend Chip Connolly has a word for it called effervescence. That that we share this moment, and that's what I find so extraordinary about live music or like a live production like yours. It's not, yeah, you can watch the recording of it. Okay, it shares something with the Super Bowl too, which is a shared, like global moment, bringing everybody together at that moment which sort of sits in opposition to this, you know, you're sort of scrolling through your Instagram feed or something. It's very different. Like you have to, if you want to participate in this cultural moment, you, you, you got to sit there, you got to, you got to be there at that moment, not the next day or whenever you feel like it. No, it's like that moment. I think there's also something that is sort of about identity here, you know, mm. um, certainly with the, with the Super Bowl, you know, they tend the narratives tend to be about sort of you know the dominant team and the underdog you know the quarterback who has the 450 million dollar deal and the quarterback who doesn't um and and music there's a similar uh, aspect in music um i went with a friend to a tool concert at an arena on long island about a year ago 
And I like Tool, the heavy metal band, kind of math rock. And I was looking around at the crowd and I was thinking, you know, I'm a California boy. Um, and uh, while I love hard rock, you know, I don't go to a ton of hard rock shows. And I was looking around at this audience and I was realizing uh, it doesn't matter what political affiliation you have, right? If you're a Tool fan, it transcends that. Mm. <laughs> and what's amazing about shows, and you see this at festivals too, um, when you're in that moment, it doesn't matter if the person next to you has very different ideas about gender. If they have very different ideas about policy, right? We're tool fans. We are joint. We are bonded together <laughs> in this moment and we are freaking out. And, and that's powerful. And I'm not sure that happens, you know, at, at the movies, maybe. And I'm not denigrating yeah. film. Obviously, I love film, but I'm just saying there's something unique about music. And especially when you go to, you know, Taylor Swift, right? If you're a Swifty and you're in one of those stadiums, you could be anybody. It doesn't matter what walk of life or your background or what side of the tracks you come from or how much money you earn. You're a Swifty and you're there and you're, and you're, it, it's like, it's almost like going to church. I mean, it's that sort of religious, uh, fervor. So it's exciting. Um, and it's challenging to kind of package that and put that on television, but that's, that's part of what we do. It was great. <laughs> I just gotta say it was great. There are very few things about television that I like. This is one of them. That sense that, like, as you said, like, I'm, well, I'm not a Tool fan. I don't really know much about Tool, but now you've, you, now that you've, you're such an enthusiastic Tool fan, maybe I need to start a Tool playlist and investigate this a little more. <laughs> you should go further, David. You should get the leather vest and you should head out to whatever <laughs> arena that was in Nassau County and, and check it out because it, it's an experience. <laughs> it's sort of a certain band artist that can do that too. So Tool clearly does that. Uh, Taylor Swift does that like in a mega way. You know, I think Bruce Springsteen is also known for that, but there, there are certain artists where it's, you're right. It's like you're entering their church and everybody's yeah. there for the same thing. And it's this beautiful, wonderful moment that, that only exists if you, you got to be there in the room. That's it. You just got to be there in the room yeah. or with the Grammys. You got to have the TV on at that moment or it's, you don't get it. Yeah. No, and I think it's one of, I mean, sports and live uh, award shows are frankly some of the only things that are driving a lot of interest in linear TV today. I mean, we have uh, we have a serious challenge as as an industry and, and we could, you know, on some level, we are we, the Recording Academy, are part of that industry because we have an annual award show that's on television. So we can't ignore the fact that people are cutting the cord. Um, you know, obviously streaming is, is a huge part of this. We do have a streaming component. We work with CBS's, um, streaming business called Paramount Plus or Paramount Global's streaming business called Paramount Plus. Um, but the, the culture is migrating. Um, but one of the few things that, that gets people to watch in real time is an award show. So, yeah. um, it, it'll be fascinating to watch how this kind of evolves over the next few years. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll just expound on it a little bit. We also are living in a kind of anti-institutional moment, you know, an anti-elite moment. And so there's definitely people who look at something like the Oscars or the Golden Globes or the Grammys and says, well, who's voting on this? You know, this nah. is not the most popular artist. Why is this person winning? Um, and it's because as an association, we qualify to have people enter to join the recording academy. You have to have a certain number of credits, you know, album making credits to be a voter in the Grammy process. So how do you in this era of kind of anti-elitism, um, even sort of merit, like what does merit mean anymore? Why do we look at merit? Everybody should get a seat at the table. So how do you navigate that and say, well, 
um, it takes a lot of work to learn an instrument. It takes a lot of work to produce a track or an album. It takes a lot of work to write a song. And we want to champion those people, right? If you put in your 10,000 hours, we want to make sure it's, we're talking about craft, right? That your craft and the work and the effort that you put into something is honored. Um, there are plenty of award shows that are about the most streamed artist or maybe the mm. artist that sold the most tickets or had the most revenue off of their tour or whatever. That's not us. We, we're a different thing. And again, I think, I think the audience recognizes that. I think that's one of the reasons they tune in is, is to say it's a peer voted award. And what do the peers think of the album of the year or the best new artist? Well, I just want to circle back to one of the things that the sort of splintering of community that it used to be, Way back in the dark ages, there were three channels and everybody watched the news at the same time. And, you know, there were certain shows that everybody watched and it was a and like a nationwide communal experience. The, the folks at Meta, who I think are just mendacious fucks. And uh, I just, I mean, we deal with that company, but I just, uh, rapacious is the word for them. You know, what they've done the splintering, and as you said, bringing people together b based on outrage versus yeah. being brought together for celebration and community support is a, like it's antithetical to their to their algorithm. <laughs> like they, they don't do that, right? It has me wondering. I'm not much of a nostalgia guy, but there's something about a nation that comes together for something. I think there's something valuable there. I don't know, I can't really put my finger on it, but there is value in things like the Grammys. There's value in things like the Super Bowl and, and these large communal experiences that I think we really need. It's like, we're not just so much an observer, we're part of something that is bigger than us. And it's obvious when you go to a big, you know, there's like 80,000 people in the room and everybody's going bananas. Like you're part of that. There's something very human about that, that you're not going to get in your basement looking on your phone. I love how you're describing it. It's almost kind of a safe space, right? In fact, Harvey hmm. talked about that. Our CEO talked about that in his address, that music is a kind of sacred zone, hmm. right? Um, when we think back sort of, I guess, 40, 50 years ago about the monoculture, right? Three hmm. channels and Walter Cronkite would tell you what was going on <laughs> in the world, you know, if there was a problem there in that paradigm, it was that there were a lot of things that were not being talked about, or there, there mm -hmm. were certainly people that were not represented. Mm -hmm. um, we seemed, and I couldn't agree with you more. I feel that we've now swung, the pendulum has swung to the very other end of it, which is, well, we're getting better representation now, but there's also somebody putting their thumb on the scale. And it is because companies like Meta are you know they monetize outrage they monetize mm -hmm. it's it's like the lizard brain they know the part of the brain it's it's fascinating too when you think back on the cambridge analytica mm -hmm. um controversy right that was a group of um data scientists who basically understood things that would outrage people based on their personality types mm -hmm. well there's actually a positive benevolent version of that and mm -hmm. as a marketer who has spent a lot of money with Meta, I will tell you that the tools are also really good at identifying who might be a tool fan <laughs> um, based on, oh, David, you know, <clears throat> drives an Audi. That means he's got a higher propensity to like tool or whatever. <laughs> so those it's crazy. But the, but the truth is those algorithms can be used for positive mm. purposes as well. I guess the the problem where I think we are now is um, we've really gotten to a place where we, because we know that there's a lot of manipulation going on um, and now it's infected a bunch of other institutions, you know, the mainstream media, the courts, the police, all these things where trust is at an all time low. And and this is global, right? I mean, the World Economic Forum was just talking about how do we reinstill trust into societies? Thank God, music is still a place where 
I trust the people at a tool concert. So, so I think if we can find our way back as a global community, it may be through the arts. It may be through understanding that these are things that bind us together um, in ways that political beliefs definitely do not, you know? When I think about the Grammys, what I see is responsible platforming. You're not going to get some crazy Nazi up there on the stage. This is not going to happen. You will on X. <laughs> I think that there's a responsibility to these platforms like X replatformed Alex Jones. Like, what? Uh, no. Uh, it's something that we, you know, this podcast and it ages that I take very seriously. I'm not going to platform a nut. I'm not going to platform somebody who I willingly know is presenting divisive or incorrect or damaging information to my people. And there have been times I've had people on this podcast who were had a lot of letters after them, they're very learned about something, and they go way in the weeds about something. And it's just like, whoa, Drew, that gets edited out. Like, that didn't happen. <laughs> just because right. this guy said right. it doesn't mean I have to platform that to all my people. There's an element of responsibility here. Places like the Grammys, obvious, right? There was a question of that. I'll, I'll give you a micro example of this. So during Harvey Mason Jr.'s speech at the Grammys this year, there was a string quartet playing in front of him. And his message was all about how music is a global force for peace. Mm. And the Recording Academy over the last year spent a lot of time with the State Department really thinking about ambassadors of peace, right? And, and, and music and its ability to, to have that influence. Well, that quartet that was playing in front of him, and he says it about three quarters of the way through his address, it was made up of musicians of um, Jewish, Palestinian, and Arab descent. Right. Now, this is live television. Live, live. <laughs> so those four players... You don't know exactly what's going to happen, but what was really interesting is um, there wasn't a ton of kind of hand wringing about it behind the scenes. And it's because, again, it, it's almost like there's a sort of code of ethics or yeah. a, a heart code or something, mm -hmm. right, amongst musicians that um, – we will play it. We may not have the same language. We may not have the same political belief. And I'm a musician too. So I have experienced this firsthand. Perfect strangers, you know, can create these wonderful harmony, harmonies together, right? Um, so there wasn't a lot of angst around, oh, what if one of those four does some stunt? No, that's not what music is. Um, right. And I think that was when he said it in the room, people had this wonderful moment and millions of people around the world saw that. I don't want to sort of sugarcoat it and say music can bring the Middle East together. But to me, it was a very powerful example of um, that music can be a balm. And um, there's, there's a shred of hope within that idea, right? There's some optimism there. And we spent a lot of time over the last year um, basically going around the world, meeting with African nations, meeting with people in the Middle East, meeting with people in uh, Southeast Asia um, about expanding our mission and um, really kind of universally embraced because I think people around the world agree with that idea. They, they, they believe that that is true, you know, that music can be a force for positive change. Um, so, yeah, hopefully we'll keep highlighting that in our show. Um, we'll keep highlighting that in our work, our advocacy work, and we can bring more people together. Um, so usually when somebody says that to me, it's really hard for me to not get in my soapbox. Um, I'll tell you a, a, a sort of a quick little anecdote about kind of the reality of the music business. And this is something that the Recording Academy spends a lot of time addressing. When you have a big award show and you see Taylor Swift and you see her on the cover of Time magazine and you find out, oh, she's a billionaire now because of uh, uh, her touring and her film and all the rest of it, it sort of obscures the fact that there are literally hundreds of thousands of people who consider themselves professional musicians who don't make a living wage. And I think the number that 
uh, we came up with uh, about a year ago is we looked at some of the Bureau of Labor Statistics numbers. And I was a little bit surprised to see that one in three households in the United States earns more than $100,000 a year. Now, that's a household, right? So that could be two incomes. And I, that's actually higher than I thought it would be. That's pretty good. With music makers, it's one in 1,000. <laughs> one in 1,000 music creators earns that kind of money from their music. So we do something each year in Washington called Grammys on the Hill. And we take about 100 different songwriters, performers. We go and we meet with lawmakers, senators, congresspeople. And we bring them and they tell their stories. And I'm not exaggerating when there will be a person in that room who is explaining to their senator, hey, you know, I had a co-write on a song by a famous artist, not going to say the name here, but who, and that stream, that there were a billion streams. One billion streams for that track. I think, wow, this person's probably got a pretty big house in Nashville. <laughs> and then she'll say, and from that co-write, I made over two years, $30,000. A billion streams equals $30,000. Um, people don't understand that um, copyright is legislated. It is decided by... Um, there's obviously copyright laws that Congress puts into effect, but things like what songwriters earn off of streaming income is decided by three people. Um, they are not elected officials. And this is not a minimum, this is not a statutory minimum wage. This is effectively a statutory maximum wage that says, as a songwriter, you will only earn this amount when your music is streamed through the big platforms. So I don't want to cast this as a you know, big tech is bad. The, the goal instead is to help people understand that when you see an artist on an award show, when you hear an artist that you love, you know, on Spotify, Apple Music, when you see a video on YouTube, what have you, understand that there's a lot of people behind that artist, um, that there's a lot of people who we need to work for. We need to really, we need to, this is, we're talking about inequity, right, here. And, and that's something that we spend a lot of time on at the Academy is trying to rebalance some of that so that there's, it's just, it's economic justice is what it is. Um, so that music creators are incentivized to continue to make music so that we have pop music and that we have the Grammys 66 years from now, you know, um, that's, that's what we work on behind the scenes. So I do want people to know that. I'll get off my soapbox now, um, but um, it's an important message, I think. John, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for your contribution to the Grammys, and thank you to everybody who does that show who made me feel great. <laughs> I really like love that. that. <laughs> yeah, how many TV shows make you feel something, right? <laughs> like Ted Lasso, but other than that, no. <laughs> All right. I'll take that. Us and Ted. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, man. It's great to have you on. It's great to see you. You know, Enjoy your time as you can in the desert and hope to see you soon in New York. You too, friend. Thank you.